I must have been a boy of about 12 or 13 years of age uh, and I must confess here much to the horror of many people uh, sitting here that as a student who was growing up in school, I studied at Sri Aurobindo Memorial School in Banashankri. Uh, I hated history uh, as a subject uh, and some of the worst punishments that I've received in life in my school days uh, was for history, including I remember my history teacher had taken two, uh, you know, scales and beaten so hard on my, uh, you know, palm for not drawing uh, Akbar's map or something like that, the reign uh, extent of his empire. There is still a mark there, the scale actually broke and a splinter went inside my palm <laughs> and of course my mother went the next morning and created a huge ruckus in school saying even we don't uh, beat our son so much and what is the big deal if he doesn't know what is the expanse of Akbar's kingdom or so on. So unfortunately that is how I think most boring and insipid manner in which we were all I think taught uh, this subject, um, memorizing by rote who succeeded whom, which year, what battle was fought, which uh, at that time we just don't realize what is the importance uh, of learning all this, just you know, mug up and vomit in the exam paper. But only as you grow up you realize that this is a subject uh, in which you can identify yourself as a nation, as a civilization and as a people. Uh, and our colonizers and also post-independent rulers, they understood this very well. And so they used history as George Orwell, the English novelist had said, he who controls the past controls the future. Uh, so that is why history was always used as a battlefield. So for someone like that, who was kneeling down outside class in every history, uh, you know, lesson, uh, the transformation to becoming a historian was completely, there's this beautiful word in English called serendipity, uh, happy accident, which was what it was. Uh, and I must owe my foray into historiography to Mr. Sanjay Khan, uh, you know, the, the Hindi actor who as I'm sure a lot of you here may remember, uh, in Doordarshan those days there was a serial called The Sword of Tipu Sultan which he had produced and he had acted as uh, Tipu in that. And if you remember the Mysore royal family of the Wodeyars was shown in an extremely poor light, very very negative manner. The Immadi Krishnaraja Wodeyar who was the Maharaja uh, was shown like this, you know, obese retard who was dancing along with the court dancer. The Maharani Lakshmi Ammanni was shown as one of those typical, you know, Ekta Kapoor film, uh, you know, vamps who are all the time conspiring, conniving against Tipu. And to show Tipu and Haider, who were actually usurpers of the throne of Mysore uh, from the Vodiyars, who had actually bought Haider, uh, you know, uh, when he was in distress as a young boy, they had to show the Hindu dynasty of the Vodiyars in a very poor light. So for a young boy at that time, who, as I said, I was in uh, I was 12 years old or so uh, and there were a lot of protests happening in different parts of Karnataka and if you remember the studio also had caught fire and Sanjay Khan's face had got burnt and a lot of people, Kannada media especially kept saying because they showed him in a poor light that's why and so oh, I was reading all of this and for a history phobic person uh, there was something in me which said I need to find out the truth behind this false representation. Uh, my family has no connection to Mysore. I must, uh, you know, underline here. Uh, my father being a Tamilian, my mother a Maharashtrian. Uh, we were staying in uh, Bangalore for generations, but uh, no connection that way to uh, uh, to Mysore. But uh, it's all, I think, uh, uh, Purva Janma Sukruta, Prarabdha, whatever destiny you may say, every vacation thereafter became uh, journey to Mysore. It was a self-initiated, uh, self-funded more importantly for a you know lower middle class family to be able to go there and uh, with never the intention that I'm going to write a book on this whole subject. It was just for Satyan Veshane to find out the truth. First about just that one king and queen, Immadi Krishna Jvadiyar and Lakshmi Ammanni and I spent I think uh, you know days, weeks, with members of the royal family, with, uh, you know, a lot of archivists, historians there, and then the mythic society. That's where the connection comes, where even as a boy of 14 or 15, I had the fortune of being introduced to Dr. Suryanath Kamath. And Suryanath Kamathji took me under his wings and almost 
every weekend i would spend at the mythic society library trying to note down uh, a lot of uh, things i think anything about mysore history this place is a treasure trove uh, the library has some of the best collections so it was all putting together all these uh, matter and this madness actually uh, continued for 10 long years even as i was doing my plus 2 my engineering and all of that uh, and then i realized that there was not even a single book in modern times on the entire span of my source history the wodiyars as you know were one of india's longest reigning royal houses uh, ruling for 600 years from 1399 to 1947 with just that 40 years of break uh, under hyder and tipu uh, but you know again uh, one of the you know problems of indian historiography among many others which i shall uh, try to touch upon in my talk where the south of india does not get featured in the manner that it should all our history is so delhi centric and north india centric that we learn about every small dynasty that ruled in and around delhi but vast parts of india uh, don't get covered in that larger historiography of india so tony morrison the american writer had said if there is a book that you want to read and it hasn't been written yet you must be the first person to write it uh, so i think i took her advice very seriously and so after 10 years of all the work that had been done my friends suggested why don't you put this all together in the form of a book and that's how serendipitously uh, my first book splendors of royal mysore the untold story of the wodiyars nobody had bothered to tell that story to the rest of the country came up about 16 years ago and then there was of course no looking back and uh, you know uh, the 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 theme of today's talk is satyan veshane the quest for truth when it comes to an indian historian and his or her quest uh, and when one is searching for the truth and moreover much against established norms established uh, you know uh, rules of the game one also needs to face a very heavy price and i i do realize that very early i was probably 25 26 when the book came out uh, and i remember an evening like this in bangalore i think it was at the bangalore international center uh, and uh, you know the, the, it was a talk on the interregnum period of hyder and tipu and i still babe in the woods did not know that this has so many sharks and landmines in the field of indian historiography uh, so i i was just i played it safe i was quoting letters of tipu sultan uh, to his general saying go to calicut uh, you know uh, break so many temples or i've converted so many people these were all just excerpts from his own uh, you know letters that i was reading and suddenly there was an eruption from among the audience people started shouting slogans and uh, paper rockets were thrown at the um, podium and the organizers had to hurriedly take me to the you know green room and the lecture closed it came on the front pages of next day's newspaper and my father poor father was sitting in the first row and one some tipu abhimani sangha or something like that they, that person came to him and said you know you have an only son you better ask him to uh, mind his words um, if you want him to live long so uh, you know it obviously it created a furor when we went back home and my mother who was extremely you know uh, aggrieved by hearing all this she made me take an oath that evening that uh, in future you're not going to talk about tipu sultan in public <laughs> <laughs> so when mothers prevail on you you have very little option so i of course uh, told her that and i st stuck to my word of course now she is no longer here uh, so i broke my promise and so <laughs> uh, the shapatha also goes once the person you have made the shapatha to has uh, left the world i guess so i'm now writing an entire book an entire full length biography of tipu sultan uh, which will <laughs> thank you which will come later this year with the hope and prayer that from wherever she is she'll be protecting me against many more such abhimani sanghas who may come with more than paper rockets to throw at uh, you uh, but the larger you know point that i started off with of george orwell and what he said about history being a controller of the past and future i think our, uh, our colonizers understood that very well the british uh, and so history was used as a very very important tool to control not only uh, you know their to consolidate their rule but also control our minds as thomas macaulay had said the entire goal of english education is to create 
a vast group of interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern who are only Indian in blood, skin color, uh, but they are English in their tastes, opinions, morals and intellect. Of course, the irony is I am also speaking in the same Macaulay's language here. We are all Macaulay putras and putris somewhere. Uh, but so deeply the intellectual colonization that uh, has uh, you know, left in terms of our disconnect from our roots when it comes to, uh, you know, language, when it comes to customs, when it comes to uh, faith and also history. And uh, so right from the beginning, we were always told that you are a nation of losers from that myth of the Aryan invasion theory that was peddled to us, which has been debunked now through genetic studies, through archaeological findings at uh, Rakhi Gadi and Sanauli and so many other places. Uh, the idea was to tell us as a nation that you are a country of no-gooders. Right from your earliest ancestors, everybody came from outside and they gave you the entire uh, you know, education, culture, values, your Vedas, your primal texts are also written by someone who's come from the outside. So it's in your destiny to be ruled by someone. And so we, the British, are only a software update, version 2.0, so to say, of that uh, thing. And since you are destined to be this way, you will have to uh, suffer uh, you know, our uh, control also. And if you see in the long list of, uh, you know, battles that we also read in our history books as we grow up, the invasions by Greeks, by Shakhas, by Hunas, by uh, Scythians, by the Arab invasion of Sindh, then all the battles, you know, Battle of Tarain, India and Indians lost, Battle of Panipat, all the battles India and Indians lost, the, you know, Battle of Buxar, Battle of Plassey, Anglo-Mysore War, Anglo-Maratha War, Anglo-Sikh Wars, all the wars that we know by heart, uh, you know, if you ask a young student today, they'll all be wars that we lost. Now today, if we are still around as the only surviving pre-Bronze Age era civilization, there must have been some wars which our poor ancestors won also. There must have been some bravery and courage that they also showed. So why is it that we are not told about these, uh, you know, conquests and wars? So that was one fundamental problem which the British, uh, you know, created for us and very dutifully after independence and that is the sadder part that you know this practice was probably perfected and made more perverse with what i would call as the nehruvian marxist consensus when it came to writing our history jawaharlal nehru was himself not a trained historian but he wrote the discovery of india which gave like a template uh, that this is how the history of india needs to be presented and all our historians, uh, you know, stuck to the theme and those who did not paid a very heavy price again, those who actually went for the quest for the truth. I must mention Dr. R.C. Majumdar, one of the most celebrated historians of India. He was asked uh, by the Nehru government in the immediate aftermath of independence to document the history of the freedom movement. And Dr. Majumdar being the person he was, he said, I'm going to write a very dispassionate account of this uh, history. Uh, it's not going to be a Congress party uh, mouthpiece. Uh, so I'm also going to very dispassionately analyze the many failings of Gandhi, the uh, you know nonviolent movement. I'm also going to bring in the violent uh, reactions, the movement of the revolutionaries, the tribal revolts, the sannyasi rebellions, all this and uh, you know in, in this narrative. So summarily, he was dismissed from this committee and in his place, actually, uh, a very pliant, uh, you know, IFS officer who was actually something to do with archaeology, nothing to do with modern history, Ambassador Tara Chand or so, he was made the head of this committee to write the official history of the freedom movement, uh, you know, for the country. Uh, and that was published by the Information and Bro Broadcasting Publications Division and so on. But Dr. Majumdar being the kind of person he was, he said, I don't need government largest. Uh, I will write this on my own. And so he has a wonderful three volume, uh, you know, history of India's freedom struggle, which he went on to write. But the larger point being, I mean, Dr. Majumdar being what he was, he could still survive this 
anti-pathy uh, from the government. But a lot of other historians post-independence had to fall in line or face the music. Uh, so in the process, you had a very, very linear, monochromatic version of what Indian historiography is, which, as I said, was a very faithful inheritance of what our colonial masters left us with. So let us now explore some of these aspects of what are these distortions that have been unfortunately produced in the manner in which we look at our own past. You know, a very famous uh, British, uh, you know, uh, official called Sir John Strachey. Uh, he used to be the trainer also for the Indian Imperial Civil Service, ICS. And on the very first day to all the cadets who would come, uh, Indians, uh, you know, he would tell them that the first thing, first and most important thing for all of you to remember is there never was and there never is something called an India. So, <laughs> I think that is something that has subliminally come into all our, uh, you know, uh, consciousness too. Even educated people today, in today's India, in news, uh, noisy news debates, everything, you find people talking of this almost as a matter of fact, that we were never a nation, uh, we were not even, uh, you know, one entity, and we were constantly fighting with each other. It was only the British who came and gave us a sense of, nationhood, culture, education, railways, hospitals and all of these things and thanks to them even this name came into uh, existence. We, we somehow believe this and so Macaulay's project uh, has been hugely successful when it comes to this aspect at least. But there again dare I say that you know there is a very very important distinction between a nation and a nation state. A nation state is defined by political borders by common codified laws. Uh, the constitutional patriots might want us to believe that India took birth on 26 January 1950 when the constitution of India came into existence. But then we are a civilization that goes back to thousands and thousands of years and the constitution is a byproduct of our civilizational ethos and not the other way around. Uh, so this concept of a nation is very different from a nation state. Nation states can change. Borders can change. You know, uh, 80 years ago, the Indian subcontinent, it looked differently than some British uh, people along with Nehru, Jinnah, everyone sat in a room and drew the Radcliffe line and uh, the contours changed. Uh, political borders can change. 20 years ago, Andhra was one unit. Today, there are two separate units. So laws, borders, all these can keep changing. But I think what is important is that is what is a nation. Uh, a common sense of emotional connect and well-being to an entity. And in that, astonishingly, there has been a great convergence over several centuries in the manner in which our uh, ancestors only saw, uh, you know, what this nation was. Uh, in the Vishnu Puran, uh, as you know, uh, this very famous uh, uh, shloka that is there, Uttaram yat samudrasya himadraschaiva dakshinam varshatat bharatam nama bharati yatra santati. This entire landmass north of the oceans and south of the Himalayas is that varshatad, that country is called Bharata and its Santati or children are called Bharatiyas. Now what more clearer enunciation can be there of what the country is? Every time when we do, uh, you know, pujas in the Sankalpa itself, like a GPS system, we are sub circumscribing the sacred geography. Jambudvipe, Bharatavarshe, Bharatakhande, everything is being located in a sacred geography. It is not just a mass of land, but it is something that all parts of India have that emotional connect to. Uh, and so, you know, when in the 8th century, 9th century, I mean, the big dispute as to what is his time, Adi Shankaracharya, when he went all over India, uh, he was from a small little town, a village in Kerala, uh, Kaledi. He could have done what he did sitting there. But he made it a point to go to all the four corners and establish the four cardinal mathas at these places. Why was that? To, that was to mark the borders of this sacred geography. When we see all our Shakti Peethas scattered across the country, the Jyotirlinga scattered across the country, the you know Char Dhams, uh, Seven Puris, they are also scattered across the entire sacred geography. That gives us an idea that you know, this is the border which is broadly Bharatavarsha and we are all children who of this land. So there, 
when shankaracharya went on his digvijaya uh, nobody in uh, say maharashtra or rajasthan said you are a foreigner don't come into our this thing you are a malayali you come from a different country when our ancestors took the tortuous you know uh, pilgrimages to various places kashi prayag gaya and all these places they didn't feel i mean they didn't know the same language also but somehow they all communicated with each other they managed to uh, you know take months and months to go to all these uh, char dham yatras and so on but never was there opposition that you belong to some other country so uh, that that emotional connect to one nation distinct from a nation state uh, in that civilizationally there has always been as i said uh, an astonishing continuity as well as convergence in the manner in which our ancestors saw it at least and this is the first distortion that is unfortunately it strikes right at the base of our identity as you as you can make out that you are not even a country you are not one of course we may have different uh, you know political uh, whatever you know affiliations groups uh, states kings were fighting each other and all of that may be true they may be speaking different languages but that common convergence that was there it is really you know every uh, example uh, buttresses that claim all the more i am currently working uh, my next book as was mentioned is called waiting for shiva unearthing the truth of kashi's gyanvapi very very timely as we see and speak <laughs> there is so much that is happening and i'm extremely fortunate to also see among the audience professor k s kannan and dr uh, meera both of whom have helped me immensely in this uh, project on kashi <laughs> now there too i mean today people will say oh it's some uttar pradesh why should we bother but just to given few examples as to how uh, you know there were so many sanskrit and nibandhas that were written right from the 10th century onwards you had lakshmi dhara of the gahadwala dynasty uh, he was uh, the one of the ministers of the king govind chandra who wrote this uh, text called kritya kalpataru and in that there is an entire section called teertha vivechana khanda in that there is description of kashi gaya prayag and all these places then you know in the 13th century onwards you had the kashi khanda which got added to the skanda purana uh, which got translated into multiple languages including in south india you had this uh, poet uh, called shri natha who translated it into telugu uh, possibly under the patronage of the vijayanagara rayas so kashi's importance uh, you know spoken about in south india you had them in maharashtra you had the guru charitra Uh, on the datta sampradaya there there is an entire section on kashi how to go there what is the panchakroshi yatra you need to do what are all the different shrines you need to take uh, you know blessings at in maharashtra now from our own state karnataka you had a hoysala king veera narasimha the third who gave a datti of an entire village hebbale uh, for pilgrims to go to kashi because at that time uh, delhi sultanate was already there if you had to go there you have to pay a jazia you know pilgrim tax uh, so for the people of karnataka to be able to afford going to kashi like the hajj subsidy given now uh, veera narasimha actually got an entire uh, you know village given to the people kannadigas to go to kashi uh, similarly vishwarupa sena the bengal ruler the gauda uh, uh, the sena dynasty of uh, bengal few uh, you know decades after kutubuddin aibak first demolished about 1000 temples all over kashi he comes and places a pillar right in the middle of kashi he did not have the wherewithal to build an entire temple so he puts a pillar right there and says this place is the uh, city of vishveshwara and it is sacred to all of us including those of us from bengal and there was a gujarati businessman vastupala who gave about 1 lakh Uh, you know in those days to reconstruct a kashi vishwanath temple in the 13th century so gujarat maharashtra karnataka uh, the telugu speaking region bengal all of them contributing commonly to the resurrection of a place in today's uttar pradesh uh, and we are told you are not even a nation <laughs> and uh, you know even when somnath uh, you know was uh, demolished and later on see so many uh, decades later even in kashi uh, you know when ahilya bai holkar of indore reconstructs the temple in 1780 it was maharaja ranjit singh who got the gold uh, plated on all the domes and today the sikhs and the khalistani movement say we are a separate nation 
Ranjit Singh also when he defeated Ahmed Shah Durrani, the Afghan ruler, uh, he is supposed to have asked him that the, the gate to the Somnath temple, which was in Ghazni then, that should be returned uh, to him. And this is still there in one of the Gurudwaras, I think the Golden Temple, uh, where that gate is still kept. So that consciousness that these are all our sacred spots, this is a sacred land, that consciousness was always there irrespective of whether we were fighting with each other politically and all of that. So that was the first distortion that is created, uh, unfortunately, in the manner in which we look at our past. The second problem, as I already mentioned, is this whole thing that you are a nation of losers, you don't, uh, you know, win uh, anything, you are destined to be subjugated by others. And this whole emphasis only on India and Indian history seen through the eyes of invaders. Now we will learn uh, chapters and chapters in our uh, textbooks about the Mughals, the Tughlaqs, the Lodhis, the Khiljis and all these. I mean Tughlaqs, Khiljis, their contribution to India or its civilization is probably next to uh, zero. Uh, barring a few monuments here and there, not much done. They were marauders and barbarians. But still we learn the succession lines of all these people. But Cholas, Pallavas, Rashtrakutas, Satavahanas, Gangas, Kadambas, the Vodayars, uh, you know, the Ahoms, Northeast uh, Ahoms also, like the Vodayars who ruled for 600 years. If we ask ourselves, can we name three Ahom Rajas of this country? I don't think we will know. Who were the rulers who ruled uh, Tripura for almost 550 years and kept that place free from foreign uh, invasions? In fact, Assam or Ahom, the very word is Asama or you know something that cannot be, uh, that is invincible and in the uh, Asamiya language Sa and Ha are synonymous and so Assam became Aham and then Ahom. So that's how the Ahomiya language, uh, you know, you uh, the very origin of that word is, it is invincible. But we don't even know who were the people who ruled there. But ask any child about uh, Muhammad bin Qasim. You will know about Muhammad bin Qasim, but you will not know that there was a Raja Dahar of Sindh who ensured that for he and his predecessor Chacha, who ruled Sindh, kept Sindh free from Arab control for almost 60-70 years before the actual invasion of Sindh. Uh, and even after uh, uh, you know Sindh fell, we must remember that uh, almost all of Middle East, uh, you know Central Asia, Africa from the edge of the Atlantic to the gates of India, uh, within 50 years of the uh, death of the Prophet and the uh, Caliph's marching armies, all this area got Islamized. They lost their, uh, you know, Persia, all this entire region. But for the first Islamic Sultanate to be established in India, it took 500 years. From 712, the Arab invasion, the Delhi Sultanate comes only by 1206. So in these 500 years, it's not a short span of time, our ancestors were pushing back. Uh, the Arabs could have easily conquered the whole of India. But who were the people who were trying to push them back at that time? They were people like Lalita Ditya Mukta Pida of the Karkota dynasty in Kashmir, <laughs> Yasho Varman of Kanauj, there was Maharana Bappa Raval of uh, Mewar, Vikrama Ditya of the Chalukya dynasty, and his feudatory Danti Durga, who later uh, you know, formed the Rashtrakuta dynasty. Again, you see North, West, uh, South, all of them forming alliances to push back the Arabs so that they, beyond a narrow strip of Sindh, they could not occupy much uh, of the country. So uh, governors after governors kept coming, but we pushed them back. Muhammad uh, Ghazni came, we feel he just came 17 times and nobody did anything. You had the Hindu Shahi rulers, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, of Afghanistan, that area, Gandhara, who Jayapala, Anandapala, there was his son called Nidarabhima. All these people ensured these people kept getting pushed back. At some point, you know, rubber band, uh, you keep pulling it, it breaks at some point. There was eventually some defeat. But the story of resilience also is something very important and that is just not told to us. So I'm not for one claiming that, you know, history should just be a 
jingoistic claim of we were so great everything about our past is great we you know that's another extreme of uh, looniness we we invented the atom bomb we had internet we had this that everything is written in the vedas i think that is a little stretching the argument a bit much uh, but you know genuine pride for what you have uh, your ancestors have achieved at the same time the mistakes that were committed which will give us like a road map of what not to repeat uh, in the future because as they say history repeats itself only because no one was hearing it the first time so uh, so that uh, you know th this uh, utility of history is also extremely important who were these people there were also lots of women in the process who again don't get their due in the larger historiography of india you had someone called rani naiki devi of gujarat from the chalukya dynasty who was the first woman to defeat a woman ruler who defeated mohammad ghori in the battle called the battle of kasarhada in 1178 ghori thought it's easy she is a regent queen so tying her little 6 year old son mool raja to her uh, you know waist she goes to the battlefield and defeats him and he so embarrassed that he doesn't look back at gujarat again uh, there was uh, uh, you know um, rudrama devi in varangal the kakatiya ruler there were so many such people velu nachiyar in um, shivaganga who also gave this resistance to foreign rulers rani abbakka from our own the abbakka devi aru all the four uh, ranis who defeated the portuguese and in neighboring you know kerala you had martanda varma who established travancore and martanda varma you know when the dutch governor came to him and literally gave him a uh, you know warning that uh, we plan to invade travancore he said oh really uh, now i am also planning a invasion of europe uh, it's just that my fishermen are still trying to put the boats uh, you know together and once he does that we will also invade uh, europe uh, and the it was not bravado it it culminated in a big war called the battle of kolachal in 1741 uh, where the dutch uh, east india company which was by then growing into a very major you know global force they were the first to be listed on the global stock exchanges they had their access of power from south africa going all the way to the middle east to india to japan maldives still that entire you know span much more powerful than the east india company english east india company he defeated them there and their pepper trade spice trade completely cut off and so uh, as a result of that you know he could not uh, the the dutch collapsed as a global power and their plans of colonizing india uh, actually did not materialize now please tell me honestly in any other country you would probably have martanda varma statues at every road square every child would be taught with probably some exaggeration about this battle of kolachal but i think even kerala kerala is on a different uh, path these days but uh, even uh, you know uh, people in kerala may not know who martanda varma is there is a very small uh, minaret at kolachal which is near kanyakumari uh, uncared for which commemorates martanda varma's victory at that battle which the members of the travancore royal family actually maintain it's in a very bad shape but nobody goes there it is not even a memorial worth noticing but we will all go and take selfies at kutub minar uh, where very clearly it is written this was constructed on the site of 27 hindu and jain temples that were destroyed at this site so i think that is the truth that we do not confront about our own past the third aspect that i'd like to touch upon is this insistence that uh, uncomfortable aspects of our history should not be spoken about uh, and that is a very very dangerous it's also a sensitive topic uh, and this is again post independence and i understand the logic or the rationale not completely attributing it to malice but the country was born after independence uh, partition which was on communal lines uh, we had seen so much of bloodshed so much of loss of life and property so the founding fathers and mothers of this country probably thought let us not talk about these uncomfortable things and let's not cause friction in a nascent uh, republic but that was okay then 75 80 years after that even now uh, to not be able to talk about all of this openly where even foreign uh, you know american historian will durant who had called the islamic conquest of india as one of the bloodiest tales of human history not just indian history but human history uh, 
is our knowledge uh, right from our growing up years uh, commensurate to all those things that happened you cannot wish away your past those things happened they have to be mentioned the way they are but here we labor under the misapprehension that somehow talking about this will cause social unrest now now why should that happen that is such a perverted uh, you know thought process about truth and how you look at the truth you are somewhere subliminally assuming that communities today are responsible for the invasion which they are not uh, no uh, you know group today is responsible for ghazni and ghori and aurangzeb and tipu sultan and all these people uh, conversely communities today should not valorize glamorize and make heroes out of these barbarians today after thousand page report of the archaeological survey of india on the gyan wapi first of all gyan wapi masjid that itself is you know the biggest oxymoron where you have a uh, masjid with a sanskrit name called well of knowledge uh, thousand page report with scientific studies uh, you know ground penetrating radar x rays um, you I, i think it's now in the public realm i'm not sure maybe it can be read artifacts that have been found after all that you know why is this attachment for a barbarian for an invaders uh, you know place uh, that he had established so there is a dire need for uh, you know decoupling of communities and these people of the past first of all you don't need people of the same community to be made your icons uh even if you want that you have lot of syncretic examples you have sant shishunal sharif you have uh, you know rahim and ras khan and kabir and so many others if you would like to use uh for that you don't have to whitewash the crimes of aurangzeb and uh, you know tipu and all these people who were barbaric uh so say that as it is that is not putting an albatross on any community today and that is something that needs to be understood by politicians and also a lot of people who propagate that this is going to uh, harm national integration i think our own dr bairappa when he was in the uh, ncrt uh, committee uh, he was clearly told that for national integration all these aspects should not be touched upon and uh, you know there is this famous circular also that the west bengal government uh, brought out in 1989 i think it was under the marxist uh, rule of jyoti basu where you know it was a longish report with two columns saying ashuddho and shuddho the ashuddho was impure and the shuddho is the pure so this committee made a survey of all the te- history textbooks from school to university the ashuddho part had all these uncomfortable things uh, you know ghazni de- uh, destroyed somnath aurangzeb did this all this cataloged and in the shuddho part it said delete this you should not be talking about this this should be toned down this should not be addressed so when you know you talk of distortion of history i mean this is of a monumental scale where one of the bloodiest tales of human history are not told because somebody is going to feel sad now we talk about the excesses of the english east india company nobody thinks that the christians of uh, india are going to get hurt by that do they uh, we talk about the bengal famine we talk about what all they did in different parts of the country as a matter of record we don't even have any hatred for the british today's british uh, we have uh, our own aliya of this city uh, sitting there in london so <laughs> we have de- colonization of a reverse kind which we have sent there to uh, ten downing street so uh, in that case why should this part be so difficult to talk about and why do you assume that that is going to hurt someone or why don't we train those people to say don't get hurt by this your ancestors also face the same kind of tortures by all of this now there are various estimates uh, you know sitaram goel ji i think had documented like 1862 or something temples on uh, uh, which were demolished and on its place mosques that were built some people say it's 30000 40000 these are all rough estimates but it was a large enough sum uh, you know uh, number of uh, temples that were destroyed uh, our places of learning were desecrated the princetons and harvards of our country nalanda takshashila vikramashila these universities were destroyed it is said that when baktiar khilji you know ransacked nalanda uh, and burnt all the manuscripts that were there the entire place burnt for 6 months that was the amount of knowledge that we lost there we were fortunate that all our knowledge was 
uh, you know, Shruti, uh, where through uh, oral tradition we manage to continue. So how many people are you going to kill? Our libraries are here. So, you know, you can burn the book, but uh, that was also one important reason why we sustained these attacks. But today too, you come out of the ruins of Nalanda, a little far, hardly five kilometers away, the place is called Bhaktiarpur. <laughs> so, I don't know in any other country in this world, uh, where somebody who has destroyed your Oxford, Princeton, Harvard, they'll be actually you know, memorialized by naming our entire village, uh, you know, after his name. But we will not talk the truth. Why? Because someone is going to get offended. In Ghazni, there used to be a pillar uh, which was on which there was an inscription which, which said, uh, Duktare Hindustan Nila Me Do Dinar. The daughters of Hindustan are auctioned here for two dinars. So large numbers of women, uh, varying numbers again, these numbers are all estimated, some say one lakh, two lakhs, taken away as sex slaves uh, and auctioned in Ghazni and all these places. So these are the wounds of history too, which first of all, justice is impossible, uh, you know, for so many intergenerational trauma that this is, but not even to be able to talk about this, uh, that becomes another very, very, uh, you know, difficult uh, issue. And worse, you whitewash that whole thing and you create some other stupid stories uh, saying these things never happened. I'll just give two examples uh, to say how this truth can be distorted. So many eminent eminent historians, as Arun Shauri had written in his famous book by the same title, Eminent Historians, including Professor Romila Thapar in her uh, book on Somnath, the constant thing is Somnath temple was not destroyed for its wealth. Uh, I mean, not, not, not destroyed on the basis of religion, it was for the wealth that was there. Now, first time, of course, it was destroyed for the wealth, I agree. And there you have to also put a subtext that, you know, the Brahmins were so cunning, they were uh, constantly uh, oppressing everyone and uh, amassing wealth and so on. So that is why to liberate the country from the Brahmin clutches, these great people did what they did. So, uh, th so first time he demolished, another shrine came, another shrine came and over several centuries, these, uh, you know, um, um, these structures kept temples kept getting destroyed. That time there was no wealth there. Uh, and people would be foolish if they would still keep the wealth there, knowing very well that, you know, it's going to be invaded and broken. So there was a theological reason for that. So when you go to the primary sources, if you're really doing Satyanveshane and you go to the primary sources, take Somnath for instance. During Muhammad uh, Ghazni's uh, invasion, there were several eyewitnesses who came. Farishta, Al-Baruni, who wrote later. There was someone in, in around the 13th century or so, Minhaj Siraj, who wrote. And they described what happened there. Now, Ghazni, Muhammad Ghazni comes through Gujarat. The Chalukya Solanki ruler Bhima Deva, he has run away in fright and so he has an easy pass to Somnath. First of all, when he goes there, he is alarmed to see that there are 50,000 common Hindus who are defending that temple. Uh, and these were all, you know, from various castes. So, so much for, you know, Brahminical hegemony and only they were concerned about the temple. It was people, from farmers, all communities holding... They were not soldiers, they were common people holding some stones and sickles and whatever they had, standing, you know, uh, ready to defend their temple. And it took Ghazni three days to kill all of them and then storm into the Garbhagraha. And as he goes there, the Pujaris come there and say, you are a Lutera, you want money. So how much ever money you want, we will give you, you please spare our God. And then according to these eyewitnesses, Ghazni is supposed to have laughed and said, if I do that, you know, I will be remembered as a trader of idols. I would like my legacy to remain as a butch shikan or a breaker of idols. And so I don't want your money. I would want to destroy this uh, Jyotirlinga. And then, of course, he breaks it. It is pounded into pieces and taken back to uh, Ghazni and pound on and always put on the steps to the masjid so that every time the faithful step on it, the religion of the kafir comes down. And this is you know, gloatingly mentioned by their own chroniclers, by their own, uh, you know, eyewitnesses. And today's historians are giving cover fire to them, saying this was not for theological reasons, this was only because of the wealth. Uh, so what sort of a distortion of truth uh, does that lead to? Another example, uh, which comes in the context of 
this new book of mine i was aghast to read a very very fantastic story that was churned uh, by some members of the erstwhile congress uh, including this man called pattabi sitaramaiya who was one of the congress presidents uh, who wrote on the history of the congress too and then a man called bishambar nath pande uh, who was a great scholar and he won several padma awards and sahitya awards and all of that also became the governor of odisha and so on so he churned this theory that uh, uh, you know aurangzeb why did he destroy kashi vishwanath temple and that's such a fascinating fairy tale which i must uh, you know narrate to all of you he tells this story that once aurangzeb is going on an expedition to bengal uh, and along with the entourage you have all his hindu rajas and ranis also going along so first of all in his entire life actually aurangzeb never went to bengal uh, even when he had to invade it was only his commanders who went he personally never undertook a uh, invasion uh, or expedition of bengal be that as it may this story says that he went so as they were crossing from agra they were going there so they crossed varanasi and all the hindu rajas they go and say mahaswami we have such a great place uh, you know we would like to stay the night here and uh, worship vishveshwara and will you please give us permission and being the golden hearted generous secular ruler that aurangzeb was he said okay so be it and he allowed to tent uh, in varanasi so then again another logical uh, you know fallacy the hindu rajas who asked permission to go and have darshan they themselves did not go to have darshan they only sent their wives uh, the rani is to go and do the puja now all the rani is go they dip in the ganga then they go and do some puja to vishveshwar and they come back now when the counting is done one of the ranis is missing and all of them are alarmed where did this rani of kutch where did she disappear so then uh, you know the uh, um, aurangzeb is also told and he so enraged how could somebody from my entourage get missed like this and another third logical fallacy ranis of rajput kingdoms going alone without security guards and soldiers that is another loophole but this story has that story also so then of course aurangzeb sent his soldiers to search for this missing rani they go to the temple apparently there is a sliding uh, you know a wall uh, with a ganesha murti on that these soldiers go and slide it and they see a flight of stairs which goes to the tehkhana where vyas ji ka tehkhana where puja is going on uh, as we speak maybe from two days so they go down to the tehkhana and there they are aghast to see this rani sitting there bereft of clothes and ornaments and she is wailing in agony and they ask her what happened and they say the evil brahmins of uh, the brahmin priests of this temple uh they you know molested me they took away all my jewels and went away and they do this normally they are so uh, you know avaricious and cunning that whoever pilgrims wealthy pilgrims come the brahmin priests always do this to them and send them back and the rajput rulers are all so you know angered by this and the rani her rani is herself they go and force aurangzeb that this is such a place of evil uh, things you must demolish it alamgir and then do aurangzeb just did not want to do it uh, he simply you know was forced by the you know public demand uh, that you have to demolish it that's why with a very heavy heart he decided to demolish the kashi vishwanath temple now this is a i don't know it's a fairy tale which even while i'm narrating i don't know what to say whether to get angered or whether to you know laugh about it so which rani was molested in mathura uh, when he destroyed the uh, you know temples there or the thousand other temples that he broke uh, when the bamian buddhas were uh, broken in full public glare in modern times uh, there was no rani who was molested there so you know let's catch the bull by its horn uh, there is an I- I- ideological and a theological problem which says it's my way or the highway anybody who does not subscribe to this subtext they will have to be eliminated so that problem as long as it exists uh, you know the the edifice of national unity cannot rests on the shaky foundations of whitewashed history uh, you cannot uh, keep you know uh, removing all these actual truths and think and assume that some day people will forget these are deep wounds of a civilization they may not have happened to you and me directly but as i said it's intergenerational trauma that has passed on from our ancestors the pitrus whom we uh, you know uh, adore in every amavasya and pitrupaksha it's their 
angst that we are trying to address uh, you know by just at least talking about it forget justice justice is a far cry so that is another very very sad part of our uh, historiography which talks only about uh, ganga jamuni uh, tehzeeb and so on uh, sometimes true a large number of times it's a false construct force fitting or making a few exceptions into a rule while the uh, need for that at the time of partition may have been clear now i think after 80 years uh, you know, we should have the maturity to talk about this dispassionately and as a matter of fact, uh, if Satyanveshane really matters, if uh, a historian needs to become a chef, uh, where the master says, you know, put so much salt, put so much uh, this thing, and you cook the meal according to what your master wants, that's a different issue. If you're really an explorer of the truth, then you need to say it as it, it, it was. I mean, itihasa, the very word which Kalhana uh, also talks about, it is, it thus happened, itihasa. So, without colouring, you mention all the facts. Of course, there are multiple viewpoints. Uh, mention all of those. The final thing before I open it up for questions is coming to the modern era, which is what I largely specialise in, uh, and the whole narrative of our freedom movement uh, and I would like to say that in the context of uh, Veer Savarkar on whom uh, you know I have uh, written those books on. There too subterfuge, half-truths, falsities which are spread constantly and popular culture that perpetuates some of these falsehoods. We all know that uh, famous you know Hindi song, De di hame azadi bina khadga bina bhal sabarmati ke sant tune kar diya kamal. Without any fight uh, you know, somebody just gave us uh, freedom on a platter. I think that does a lot of disservice to the enormous sacrifices that thousands and thousands of people have given over multiple time periods, right from 1857, which was, and before that, of course, as I said, you had the tribal uh, revolts, Birsa, Munda, and all these people. You had the armed, uh, you know, uh, resistance, right from, you know, Tipu Sultan, what he gave to Velu Nachiar, to uh, the Marathas, all of them. And then the tribal, uh, you know, uprisings, the Sanyasi rebellions, all that there. But from 1857, which is, which Savarkar called the first war of Indian independence, to 1946, which was called, which is still called the Naval Mutiny and not the last war of Indian independence, there was a continuous and unending stream of violent uprisings which went in parallel to what the non-large-scale nationalist, uh, you know, Ahimsa uh, Satyagrahas that went. They were as important as this also. I'm not saying one, you need to disparage one to uh, highlight another like Sanjay Khan did, but I'm just trying to say that both of them are equally important and the truth of that needs to be told. We are just told in our history books that these were isolated incidents of bravery. Some young men, you know, who uh, uh, picked up the pistol or bomb, killed some fellow and then they were sent to the gallows. That's all. And Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev, Rajguru, they come in some amount. They also, I think, lionized only after all these Hindi films started coming about them. But by and large, the entire story of the revolutionary movement of Indian freedom struggle also deserves to be told truthfully in a manner that, uh, you know, is based completely on facts and also the kind of tortures that most of these people underwent. Uh, you know, and it's, it's truly, uh, it says something that not one Congress member was ever sent to Kalapani in Port Blair, uh, whereas it was only political prisoners who were there, were all revolutionaries uh, who languished. And the kind of tortures they faced there, uh, even now you have goosebumps when you think about that. You know, the basic human rights of good food, Toilet facilities, medical facilities not given to all of them. Most of the food that used to be given was mixed with pieces of reptiles or whatever and eating that, uh, most of them would end up with diarrhea. Uh, and there were fixed timings when you could even visit the washroom. Uh, so if you have diarrhea and if you need to keep visiting, then you know uh, most of these political prisoners, they would end up uh, urinating and defecating within their own cells, uh, narrow little cells that they lived in. Um, and you, you couldn't even stand up, you know, to your height in most of those cells. So imagine sitting, sleeping, standing, eating amidst your own squalor. 
uh, what that does to the human spirit these were all young people teenagers in their 20s who suffered there and day long this kolhu ka bel punishment gana dettu where round and round they go the uh, oil press um, where instead of the bullock you had the freedom fighter yoked to it and you had to in the blazing heat of port blair extract 30 pounds of oil and at the end of the day that oil would be measured even 1 ounce less you would be uh, whiplashed uh, and so electric shocks so many things like this many of these young people uh, either committed suicide or they went insane in fact the british started an entire asylum mental asylum in port blair at this place called haddo island only because there were so many you know people who were losing their sanity because of the tortures that they faced but today amongst ourselves if we say forget savarkar uh, name five other young people who lost their lives or suffered the worst of inhumanities in kalapani uh, because of whose sacrifice all of us today are sitting in this air conditioned room and being able to breathe free democratic Uh, air of india i don't know if we'll be able to name five people and what does that say about us as a nation what does that say about our gratitude uh, you know for our own ancestors and what they did for us so the one of the fundamental i think tenets of any satyanveshane is to not only bring to ourselves that sense of pride but also a sense of that gratitude for all these tortures and sufferings of so many you know thousands and thousands of people over several centuries which is what has brought us uh, you know here today so from the ancient times to the medieval times to the modern times i have tried to paint in this uh, short uh, duration of time a picture of the kind of distortions that uh, have been willfully presented these are not uh, you know accidental these are willful for political gains for larger clandestine designs and they continue to be you have even now you know in the academia in the university setups particularly outside india who do not like the rise of a uh, you know india as the new power that it is uh, emerging as to sap us of this sense of self respect to break our spine but you know even mohammad iqbal had to say kuch to hai ki hasti mitti nahi hamari there must be something and i said even mohammad iqbal had to say that uh, that there is something in us that uh, will not get extinguished so i hope uh, you know at least now with all the education with all the information age that we have uh, where uh, you know who controls information or what is right history is not guarded by a group of dog in the mangers who will sit and watch uh, act as watch guards it's democratized it's accessible to everyone i hope we start looking at our own past in ways uh, expanded than what we have been monochromatically uh, you know brainwashed to think of and as i said the path is no less than a battlefield uh, this satyanveshane it is a very difficult task uh, as i said in my own personal experience i realized that serendipitously again in that uh, lecture in bangalore where uh, talking the truth hurts a lot of people a uh, historian also needs to have a very thick hide i think you are you know being sensitive uh, being also a you know carnatic musician myself i used to take this very sensitively before that you know they don't even know me why are they hating me so much i'm just uh, talking the truth but then you realize the larger agendas the insidious agendas and at that time uh, you know you must realize that this is a larger dharma yuddha so to say that one is fighting for and in that all is fair in love and war uh, and so in this war uh, i hope more and more uh, you know bharatiyas actually participate in this in the uh, not necessarily in the excavation of the truth that is uh, our job we'll go out of job if everyone starts doing that perhaps but at least you know in disseminating this uh, information among the larger uh, you know population of this country and to have that sense of genuine pride for what it means to be an indian so once again thank you so much for this patient hearing and i'm extremely thankful to <laughs> professor shastri